Can I welcome members to the 11th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. We've got one apology, and that's uh, Alison Harris, MSP. Um, can I welcome John Paul Sheridan and Robert Howie to the meeting to give their evidence on the Prescription Scotland Bill. Um, before we start, there's one business we must decide, and that's a uh, de decision on taking business in private. Has proposed the committee take item four, consideration of the de delegated powers provision in the Social Security Scotland Bill, as amended at stage two in private. Does the committee agree to do that? Okay. So we'll move on to agenda item two, which is consideration of the prescription bill. Um, we've got a couple of panels uh, with us today representing the legal profession. Um, so welcome again, John Paul Sheridan um, of the Obligations Committee of the Law Society of Scotland and Robert Howey, QC of the Faculty of Advocates. Um, thanks very much for coming, gentlemen. And I'll open the evidence session and I think we've got uh, opening uh, two or three questions from Neil Finlay. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Um, we'll try not to fall into cliché and stereotype talking about lawyers and money this morning. I'm sure we'll get those gags over early. Um, section uh, 3 of the bill talks about the five-year uh, uh, prescription to obligations to pay money. Um, I wonder if you could comment on the general principles of the uh, Section 3 and um, in relation to the exemptions in Section 3 also. Well... The general uh, view is that parties or anyone should be able to move on with their circumstances after a period of uh, uh, five years. Um, so they shouldn't be chased for debts after that period of time. So if someone has an outstanding mortgage, or sorry, a, a credit card or a bank overdraft, then they should be able to arrange their affairs so that they can't be chased after that period of time. Um, obviously, that is the legal principle applicable in most areas, uh, in most countries around the world. Um, in terms of the exemptions, the, the vast bulk of the exemptions are not there for any legal or logical reason in the sense that um, the, their, a debt is treated any differently. Uh, the principle uh, is obviously whether or not it's fair for the more common good, for taxes, council tax, social security payments uh, and the like for people to be able to avoid repaying those after a period of time. Certainly um, the society's previous response indicated that they were of the view that council tax uh, should not be an exemption because uh, in, as we understand it in England and Wales the principle prescribed after six years uh, which is the Eng English equivalent limitation period. Uh, and we can have come across situations where there can be particularly harsh results in council tax scenarios because it's joint and several. So you could have two tenants, for example, one who has paid their fair share, they split up, move along, and they can be chased seven, eight, nine years down the line. Um, but we understand that there may well be political reasons uh, for that not to be uh, treated in the same way as, say, for example, a commercial debt arrangement. Um, but that, that's the sort of general statutory exclusions. Certainly tax and social security are reasonably common uh, exemptions. The child maintenance issue? Well, again, th there's, there's no legal or logical reason why that should be uh, treated any different from any debt. However, again, it's a matter for, for the committee as, as better able to assess political dimensions than I am, but I see no reason uh, in principle why that should be, why why you shouldn't have that as excluded. There is relatively little I have to say about this gentleman because faculty takes the view these are political considerations and therefore faculty expresses no view on them. Um, there's some questions raised about uh, various drafting points uh, and the faculty's um, response to the bill um, in relation to Section 3. Maybe can you summarise briefly what those are? Um, the short answer is no, because they're detailed, um, and that's why they're down in print. There is, with respect, little benefit in discussing individual drafting matters just as somebody talking about it 
it tends from lots, many years of unhappy experience not to work. Uh, and it's better to look simply at what has been said as to why it is that it, it's been contended that the drafting becomes unclear, as it suggested in the drafting originally. You have also to bear in mind that the faculty is talking about the original draft as originally produced, and certain changes have, we know, been made in order to meet a number of the objections which may be made on objecting uh, in the drafting points, and therefore a number of them simply no longer have relevance. But uh, they tend to be rather detailed uh, items, and frankly, they're best read in print. You have the benefit of legal advice. You can operate on that principle, I suspect. I would not be putting your time to the best use to say it all again and probably in different language and then have somebody saying yes, but the other word is here. So what's the difference between that word and this word, which of course is exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. Um, you get, I don't know if it's one of the things you were intending to ask about, but you get an almost ideal example of it when you get to the discussion of act neglect and default later on, where there's a proposal to change this. And uh, one of the issues there is, well, we say we don't see the need to change it because everybody knows or at least all lawyers know what act neglect and default mean because there's a House of Lords case that tells you what it means. Even if you weren't brought up with Cranmer in good Presbyterian country, we might be a bit bemused as to what some of it is or not have the immediate grasp of it since we were that high. But there is, a, as I say, a House of Lords Act that tells you what the answer is. So once you've been told what the answer is in this very field, in a Scottish appeal, why change it? It looks like you're trying to achieve some change of meaning when, in fact, as I understand it, you're not. But that just demonstrates part of the difficulty about talking about drafting changes. They're best looked at in print, with respect. Your brevity is welcome. Thank, thanks for sparing us. But uh, um, I, I mean, do you think these are, are these drafting errors in your in your view, or are they, are they a significant issue? I'd like to avoid the word. They're drafting questions. I'd like to avoid the word errors because um, it's simply an exercise in hypocrisy to talk very much about drafting errors. Everybody knows it's fearsomely difficult. You think you've got it right and you can guarantee that the one thing that happens if you do this commercially, for example, is the one thing you didn't draft for. That problem is writ large when it comes to the parliamentary draftsman and it's all very easy for us to sit in a court and say, well, that wasn't terribly clever drafting and frequently it wasn't. But um, this is simply a matter of drafting. It's not as if hiding a particular sub substantive issue the danger is that what is lurking, particularly in, in one of the ones that we had mentioned, though I think this is one of the ones that had been corrected, was there was one which potentially hit a substantive issue, and that's why the Commission changed the drafting. Okay, that's good. You finished, Mr Finlay? Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so, Section 5 of the Bill um, relates to the start date for five-year prescription in uh, in relation to the obligation to pay damages and it reverses the effect of a Supreme Court case, that was the Morrison case. Um, the SLC consulted on four options for Section 5 of the Bill. They decided to use Option 3. Um, can I ask you which option you favour, both of you, and, and why? Um, are there any drawbacks to the option now set out in Section 5? Uh, and if you like, you can give some examples to illustrate your point the the the, the law society favored option three although we wouldn't have any had any significant problems with option two um, just to, to summarize what the issue was um, Morrison ICL plastics was a, a explosion um, of the plastics factory in Mary Hill a number of years ago and everyone had understood the law to mean that the five-year period started from the date you knew there'd been a loss and that the loss had been caused by someone else's problem. So what happened there, there'd obviously been a loss, everybody knew there'd been an explosion, but it had taken a number of years to work out what happened. There'd been prosecutions for, for deaths, there'd been a fatal accident inquiry in a number of years past. Um, and Everyone had taken the view that you needed to have both the loss and an awareness of who's caused the loss before the, the five years started to, to tick. But the Supreme Court in that case said, no, it's the awareness of the loss that was key. Now that has been obviously followed on a number of other occasions and it's, it's led to some problems or what people view as very harsh results. And, and one of the other ones that's featured quite heavily in the Scottish Law Commission is the case of Gordon's trustees in Campbell Riddle. 
Uh, I hesitate to go into that in too much detail because I'm conscious my fellow panellist appeared in the Supreme Court in, in that case and probably knows an awful lot more about it than I do. But one of the issues in that case was to do with a, a, a farming tenancy and the, the landlord had issued notices to remove the tenant um, and it turned out ultimately some years down the line that those notices were defective and what the court had said ultimately in that case was that when you incurred costs trying to remove the person that was a loss. Uh, now I do have a slight concern that the way that the, the, the drafting has been set out is that, that it doesn't actually deal with that particular problem and it's a question of what loss is. Uh, so for example if you take a standard case where somebody buys a house they pay their solicitor and they pay the surveyor and many years later uh, it turns out there's a problem, they don't own a part of the ground or there's some problem with the building. On one view, the person incurred the loss when they paid the professional fees uh, to the solicitor or the surveyor. Now, I don't think that would be the intention, but on one view of the wording, you have incurred a loss right at that point in time. Um, so I, I'd have slight concern about the wording there, but certainly generally we're of the view that it does provide more clarification uh, for the general sense, and it puts the law back to what it was understood prior to the decision in the M Morrison's case. Um, <clears throat> I have to declare an interest. You've already heard part of what it is, but in fact I was the losing senior in both of the cases. Um, so I have to be um, a little careful about what I say about each of them. Uh, however, Clause 5, as we understand it, is directed to a rewrite of Morrison. Uh, so as to restore the law to what it had previously been, that there was a thing known as the actionability test, i.e. that you had to be aware of the fact that this great act, neglect and default was the source of the problem, i.e. that there was something legally exceptionable, which was what had caused your loss. In Morrison, um, as Mr Sheridan says, everybody knew immediately that there was a horrible hole where there used to be a wall, uh, but it didn't follow that they knew that it had been that the reason that that hole existed was down to the negligence of some third party. Now, with respect to Mr. Uh, Sheridan, it may have been a slip of the tongue, but the law has uh, not been so far that you needed to know the identity of the person who was responsible. You never needed to know that. Um, the part of the catch sometimes was that you knew that somebody in there, and that is why you had building contracts with about five sets of defenders in them, because you knew one of them was responsible for this, but you might not know which. But the fact that you know one of them has got to be responsible for this meant the time was running and the responsible lawyer didn't hang around and let his client wait before suing. You got him sued and then you could sit back and think once it was safe. Now, what this does is it restores the actionability test. That's what subparagraph B is designed to do. As Mr Sheridan says, it's not directed immediately to the Campbell Riddle problem, which uh, was about what is loss for this purpose, and that is not addressed here, and presumably that is because the Commission considers that loss should continue to mean whatever it is that came out of Campbell Riddle meaning. The trouble in Campbell Riddle was that um, the loss could be said to have arisen as soon as the unfortunate landlords had paid their solicitors their fees for drafting the notices that turned out to be defective a year later, so that was one year gone before they knew anything about it. And there are still worse examples than the rather uh, harsh one for the unfortunate uh, uh, landlords in uh, Gordon's trustees. The classic is the person who has a, where there is a trust defect in drafting, which only emerges after a generation when someone dies at the age of 98, uh, and uh, time has long since run before anybody knew there was even a problem. And uh, the other one is the uh, perhaps more common uh, case where there has been a terrible uh, mistake made in conveying land. And that shows up when somebody sells the house 22 years later and there is nothing to be done about it. And uh, that, as I understand it, is not what uh, Section 5 is designed to do. Section 5 is designed to reverse Morrison and to change the law in a case called uh, Dunfermline District Council against Blythe and Blythe, which is the one that says you don't need to know the identity of the defender. What it will do is mean that the time for prescription will start running a lot later than it does now. 
and certainly uh, faculty was of the view that that was no bad thing. We were in, as it were, the same position but the opposite way around from the Law Society. We weren't re really concerned whether uh, Parliament chose to legislate in favour of the second or the third option. Uh, just so long as they legislated for one of them. Our marginal preference was for the second, the same way I understand the Law Society was marginally the other way, but it is entirely marginal, and if it seems proper uh, to Parliament to legislate for the identity of the person being in, that's not a matter of which we would complain. Okay. Any follow-up questions to any of that? No? Just in relation to say the conveyancing situation um, explain to me just uh, the practical differences this would make right. if, uh, if there's a con conveyancing error right um, you need to uh, um, have a situation in which if you imagine the situation at the moment uh, there is a conveyancing error is made we'll assume it's fatal um, the matter is not noticed at the time, the document goes on to the registers. Nobody bothers to look at it again for 20 years till you sell the house. The difficulty here is that uh, it will be taken that, as matters presently stand, you look at loss with hindsight and you say, paying the lawyers was the first item of your loss because it was wasted. You bought, if I can use that phrase, um, a good title to your house. You didn't get it. You got a piece of paper with words on it, which was legally quite worthless. So the money was thrown away. Therefore, one says, in retrospect, that was loss. You knew perfectly well that you were doing the facts which amounted to loss because you knew you were paying your lawyers and you knew your pockets were getting the lighter. However, um, that means that you are, uh, time starts running against you. And by the time you find out there's anything wrong, time ran 10 years ago. What uh, uh, Clause 5 is designed to do is to say, right, um, you have to know, or reasonably, constructively, or actually, if I can use the shorthand for the moment, you have to know uh, the three sets of facts. So the first of these is that um, loss has actually occurred. And of course, the idea is that's meant to hold up the date till you find out that there's a problem when you try to sell your house. Being a loss which was caused by act or omission, now, uh, in the house sale uh, context, that's unlikely to be terribly difficult. That's more of a problem elsewhere. If I go back to Morrison, Morrison could have been not the result of anyone's fault. If you imagine that the misdesigned gas system was simply designed wrongly but not negligently, i.e. it was not something where you could point to a fault that was objectionable, something that no ordinarily skilled designer would have done of acting with ordinary care. It was just the state of science when that system was done was such they didn't know there was a problem there. So the design was wrong, it caused it to blow up, but it wasn't anyone's fault. So that's one where you've got to try and find out that it was somebody's fault, or at least that's what we all thought we had to do until I made the nasty discovery in London. And. Uh, in the conveyancing case, that's not the real problem. In the conveyancing case, it's nobody has reason to believe there's a loss at all. And what this is seeking to do is to say that until you know that you've got a loss caused by an identifiable person's fault and the identity of the person, in this case, won't be difficult either. But until you know the last of these things, time isn't running against you. So what it'll do is move time running from when you paid your lawyers in the first place 20 years ago to when you find out there's a problem and somebody tells you it's because somebody made a terrible mess of the conveyancing. So it'll move the date quite dramatically in that class of cases. What's the role of the insurance industry in this in terms of delaying tactics that they use? Does that mean that the egg timer is running down all the time that they prevaricate and delay? Well, if you look at the, the responses to the Law Commission paper, generally the insurers uh, favoured retaining the decision uh, from Morrison's as being the applicable law. Um, 
Mm -hmm. as, yeah, as indeed did the firms of solicitors who are, are viewed as the insurer firms. Um, the society takes a neutral view in that. The society is solicitors who act on both sides of these things. I personally don't act for any insurers. I, I tend to act on pursuing claims of this nature um, and therefore <laughs> understandably favoured uh, lengthening the prescription period. Uh, but the view generally, I think, amongst the, the, the members of the Obligations Committee at the society was that the prescription period should be extended in the, in the sense that the decision in, in Morrison was unfair and harsh and, and should be returned to the position previously. I have a personal interest in a case that some of you maybe, I don't know if you are, the Happy Valley Road case in terms of convincing the Law Society has been involved with it. And it's not particularly related to prescription, but it is a situation where the, um, uh, the owners of the property have done nothing wrong ever in this case and have been very badly let down by the insurance industry and the legal profession and still have not got that situation entitled to the property yet, as far as I'm aware. Anyway, I dive home, so I'll divert away from that. Okay. A little careful of instantly jumping to the assumption that the insurance industry is always delaying things. And the examples I was giving you of the bad it's ones... always. Yeah. In this case, they have. Um, the kind of example I was giving you in relation to the conveyancing flaw or the Morrison type of thing, there was nothing that insurers could do for good or ill about changing the time at all. The problem is wholly independent of anything they do. And uh, when you get uh, the issue which may arise with delays is one that was canvassed by some of the respondents, which was to do with um, delay in prosecution of actions and what should, whether or not prescription should keep being in, uh, um, interrupted permanently by uh, actions which are raised and which may take an awful long time to go and which then, when they are thrown out, let us say, restart a new period of prescription for an immensely long period of time away. But um, it is, with respect, a little too easy just to jump to the conclusion that the insurance industry is always out for its own fell purposes to delay things to secure prescription. It frequently isn't doing anything. You said that, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, David, I, I wonder if this leads into your question on the, the Hugh, Hugh Patterson uh, case. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, the committee is aware of a Parliament petition from Hugh Patterson, which provides an example of a situation where 20-year prescription has operated harshly. The petition relates to a situation where a solicitor made a significant mistake when applying to register a change of ownership of a house. Furthermore, the mistake is not discovered until the 20-year prescription has extinguished the associated right to sue a solicitor responsible for the damage. How common is this type of situation at the moment? And do you think these types of cases can be successfully dealt with by measures other than reform of the 20-year prescription? I have no immediate knowledge of okay. this case at all, but I take it that it's an example of the kind of genus that we've just been talking yes. about. Yes. Um, and the fact, therefore, that I know nothing about it probably makes it a lot easier to say something. Um, there is a difficulty here. 20-year uh, prescription is here for a critical purpose, which is to ensure certainty. Here, as it seemed to faculty, there are differing uh, interests at play from those which are at play with a short negative prescription, where one can see grounds for um, extending time in the interests of pursuers. With 20 years, the whole object of the exercise is to bring things to a final halt. And that's the, that's the critical and most important thing, generally on a public interest basis. There will be hard cases, Mr. Patterson's may be one of them, I don't know, where um, people do go over the 20 years and they find themselves simply without remedy. That's the classic adage of the hard case that makes very bad law if you legislate on the basis of it. One has, if I may suggest it, to legislate on the basis of the general cases and accept that, unfortunately, from time to time, there are going to be hard ones. Um, I cannot answer at all the suggestion whether or not there would be other ways around of getting around the kind of problem that arises in Mr. Patterson's case, because I just don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything to, to, to say beyond that, other than say we're supportive of having a final cut-off point at 20 years. 
Um, I have read Mr. Patterson's petition. I don't know the full circumstances, but it, as Mr. Howie says, it, it's it, there are always going to be problematic cases, and I don't think you can design a law which covers everything. Is it not right, though, that if you if you only discover that there's been an issue after after twenty years, say when you say when you sell a property, that's when you find out there's been an issue. Surely. Surely it's right you should be able to do something about that in law. Respect, no, and indeed, as I understand what's being proposed by the Commission, the Commission would make it even clearer that you can't do anything about it. Um, the object of the exercise is to secure a date which is absolute cut-off date, where, which is certain, which uh, the insurance industry and indeed all of commerce which insures itself against risks can work against. What you can't have is a situation where liabilities could keep on running. This, for example, feeds into the question which was raised about should 20-year prescription be able to be interrupted, to which faculty certainly said no. And the reason is because if you can interrupt it, uh, <clears throat> and by interrupt I mean uh, stop it and restart it again from the beginning once you restart the situation that exists now, uh, then you have a situation in which you never know when liabilities are going to end. I think the Commission had an example of a liability which would last 39 years. Now, that makes it very difficult, certainly very expensive, possibly even impossible to insure against. And that's not in anyone's interest at all. So, um, uh, when it comes to the 20-year prescription, it seemed to members of the faculty that the crucial importance was bringing about a final end date. And some people are going to suffer because you do that. That's undoubted. And there are going to be bad cases, and there are going to be cases which, if they came before any of us, we'd be sitting there trying to find some scheme or another which we could use to get round it, recharacterize it. Some you know, lawyers are paid to do that kind of thing. And that would be when your professional ingenuity would be put to a test. But for the purposes of determining how does one legislate on the general case for um, the good of the public at large, then I suggest that's not the way of approaching it. Legislation for individual cases has been found in the past to be the legislation which proves to be most problematic, shall we politely call it. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Section 8 would change the start date of the 20-year prescription for the obligation to pay damages. For Section 8 of the Bill, you express some concerns about how it would work in relation to omissions to the Act and ongoing breaches. The SLC says the oral evidence to a committee that the language used in Section 8 would be familiar to the courts from another part of the 1973 Act, and so it could not see a difficulty here. Are you now content on this point, or do you remain concerned? We remain concerned. Uh, we are concerned that uh, it is difficult to say um, when uh, an omission stops or just nothing happens. How do I distinguish between nothing any longer happening and the omission carrying on? It just isn't possible. It may be that uh, what has been, uh, was being done by somebody uh, is no longer being done by him, but other effects from elsewhere mean that nothing appears to be happening or nothing is being noticed to be happening. And if there is a concern about an importance attending the need to notice what is going on or to be able to notice what is going on, how in a number of kinds of cases we've been talking about some with, for example, technical legal breaches, how is the ordinary member of the public to know that that is or isn't happening? It just can't be done. It may be it's a problem that can't be fixed, I grant it may be that this is possibly as good as you can do because, as I say, you just can't distinguish the ends of emissions. But um, we had some uh, nervousness that in the cases of emissions in particular, uh, this wasn't going to work terribly readily. Perhaps it can't be made to work readily. That may be a fair enough point for the Commission to make. Yeah, any thoughts on that, Mr. Chair? Our concerns, uh, the society, in terms of uh, 
ongoing breaches and emission cases. Um, that's in our previous response and it's in our draft written response to this as well. But 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 like like Mr. Howie, I'm not sure that there is a solution to that. Okay. The obligation to pay damages in Section 8 of the Bill proposes a new start date for a 20-year prescription. This will be earlier in some cases than the current law and never later. Is there a risk with Section 8 that you would see more cases with obligations to pay damages is extinguished by a 20-year prescription without the right to a holder ever having to be aware there is a problem in the first place? If so, is Section 8 a good idea on this basis? I think the, the answer to the first part of that is yes. Um, you will have the, the current law is, is 20 years from when the obligation became enforceable and what's being proposed is 20 years uh, from the date on which the act or omission took place, which is always going to be either at the same time or earlier. Um, so I think the short answer is yes, we will find situations where uh, there are people who are left in a situation where they have no awareness of a problem. Um, is that a good idea or not? Again, we go back to what we discussed about earlier about the certainty and the whole purpose of having the 20 year cut off point is to have finality and certainty. Um, so if, if that's deemed to be a good, then yes. Um, the faculty was fairly firmly of the opinion that securing certainty was to advantage here and indeed to tie this, even it's at, um, to the uh, act remission uh, was uh, wiser than trying to tie, tie it to loss because loss will simply mean that the uh, date you start from bounces off way further into the future and you could end up with these 39 year and indefinite obligations which are uh, in our opinion thoroughly undesirable. Therefore we felt that that was uh, an advantage. We are not persuaded that the problem to which you advert is one which is going to be particularly significant statistically or serious. Most of these cases of damages will be covered by five-year prescription things and therefore discoverability and all the rest of it. There comes a point, however, at which you have just got to say an end uh, has to be uh, come to. I was about to say enough is enough, but I think that's probably an unwise phrase to use right now. Um, but you have to say an, an, end, uh, true. Uh, an end has to be brought to this. And uh, we felt that that was the greater advantage because we suspect that the number of cases which will actually present the problem with which you show concern is going to be very limited indeed. They'll mostly be caught by five years or, vi or extensions of five years. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Stuart McMillan. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, panel. Um, I just want to go back to section uh, six and um, it really has been touched upon in uh, some of your answers over the last few moments regarding the 20 year uh, prescriptive period. Uh, so, Mr. Howey, th you, you were quite clear uh, that uh, that you don't feel as if there should be uh, any interruptions. Uh, but, Mr. Sheridan, can you just clarify your position and the position of the Law Society, please? Um, yes, the, the Law Society's position on this is that they, they're happy not to have any interruption to the to prescriptive period for 20 years. Um, and that's different from the five year period, but w I think we're at one with the faculty on that. Um, certainly in the, uh, the SLC discussion paper, uh, Brodie's had suggested uh, otherwise. Uh, they suggest that, uh, that there should be uh, an interruption period. Um, do you have any comments about uh, Brodie's suggestion? Uh, no, I, I'll let, there's a representative of Brodie's think on the next panel, I'll let them answer for themselves, but certainly that wasn't the view of the, the society as a whole. Yeah. They're suitably primed now. <laughs> Um, and uh, on section 7 uh, of the bill, um, it states that, uh, that the 20 year prescription period, uh, which applies to certain property rights, uh, will no longer be able to be interrupted, but can be extended only uh, to allow ongoing litigation to finish. And certainly in response to the consultation on the draft bill, the faculty suggested that the approach in section 7 might not work uh, as well for property rights like servitudes. Uh, can you explain uh, why not and whether there are any alternative approaches which might actually work better? The concern which the faculty had here was that <coughs> uh, when you have uh, servitudes, these are rights which run with the land and keep on going indefinitely into the future. 
And uh, the idea that you can have uh, prescription uh, coming along, prescription must not be allowed to stop uh, continuing property rights simply by saying they continue until this action finishes and then apparently they would somehow prescribe at, at the end of, of the action. But if you have rights which are land rights which are meant to continue, uh, are these not meant to be rights which, broadly speaking, relate to property and are therefore meant to be imprescriptible? You don't lose your rights to property simply because you're not litigating about them. So that if you do have a dispute about them, why is it that uh, if 20 years comes along and that uh, dispute is still going, it lasts only till the end of that litigation for should not the right to servitude still continue in any event, whatever the outcome of the litigation. If the outcome of the litigation is that you don't have a servitude right, well, there's nothing to talk about. If the outcome of the litigation is that there is a servitude right, um, why is it that you've been declared you do have a servitude right, except that apparently, according to this, now that it's gone over the 20-year period, it's automatically been prescribed? That seemed to us to be wrong. Okay. Uh, would you have anything to add to that, Mr Sheridan? No. no. OK, thank you very much. OK, um, I just wonder, gents, if you could explain uh, for us, uh, because you're doing so well in plain English, um, uh, what the issue is over the uh, contracting out of prescription, and then I'll ask you your views on that. The, the contracting out position is that under the 1973 Act, parties couldn't agree effectively to put the five-year period on hold and they had to raise proceedings and serve those proceedings in order to interrupt the five-year. What's being proposed here is that parties will be entitled to enter into a contract effectively to suspend that period without the need to raise proceedings. Um, what's proposed in the draft bill is slightly narrower than what was in the original discussion paper um, in the sense that uh, the period in time is restricted to only uh, one year, so parties can only put things on hold for a year, uh, which would effectively extend the prescription period from five to six years. Certainly as far as the Law Society are concerned, we don't see any reason why it should be restricted to one year, because if parties want to agree to put things on hold for two or three years, then we don't see any particular reason in principle why that should be objectionable. You can have all sorts of reasons why investigations might need to still go on or there's issues about loss or calculations or looking at different remedial solutions which might take longer than a year. And the whole purpose of this section is to say, well, this is to stop people having to incur the costs of raising proceedings. And if it's just being delayed for one year, then you may end up having situations where people contract out for a year and then still need to raise proceedings anyway because it hasn't been resolved. So, but basically, both parties would would agree to put things at a standstill yeah. for yeah on, the, only a year under these proposals. Yes, that's, your, that's your argument I'm, is well, you, you should be able to agree to your own, almost any period you like. Yeah, well, that would be subject to the twenty year maximum. Yeah, yeah. But but yes, I have no particular problem with with anything two, three, four, five years, whatever. I don't see any any problem with that. As long as both parties agree to that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mr Howie, you got any thoughts on that? Um, faculty was very much more antagonistic to this idea. Um, we were the people who were saying that there had to be very tight restrictions on these so-called standstill agreements if you were to allow them at all. And uh, we would very much favour their being restricted to no more than one year. Uh, the danger is that if you allow them on an open-ended basis, they will be abused roundly. The, what you will end up happening is that there will be provisions to extend um, being put in uh, contracts. If you didn't have, for example, the uh, restriction in 2A here, which says you can only do it after the period has commenced. Now, the importance in that is to stop people writing it into standard form contracts right at the start, because that effectively means saying, I write in a provision of my standard form contract because I've got lots of money and you don't, and I'm bigger than you, and I'm going to use my commercial power is that your obligations to me last for 40 years and mine to you last for 40 minutes. Now, we regard that as thoroughly undesirable. And it is 
unless you have a restriction, for example, about when you can arise, make one of these agreements. That's the kind of thing we fear happening, and we're not persuaded that uh, legislation against unfair contract terms will be able to get at that. People will draft around it. They do regularly. We're also concerned that the danger, other danger is that if you don't restrict the period of time for which you do it and the number of times you do it, it will become an excuse for procrastination, for Fabian tactics, for delaying uh, for foul reasons or fair, and that uh, it's an invitation for nothing to happen to, in fact, invite the very problems that prescription is there to prevent. Evidence going stale, actions not happening on time, people being persecuted with old claims which can't prove because everybody's forgotten and the documents have been lost. And generally, all the reasons we have prescription in the first place are in danger of being thrown out with the bathwater. And lastly, it seems to us that there is a question as to the logical sense in having legislation in which Parliament says, we have produced a carefully calibrated balance between the interests of pursuers and defenders. And we say it's five years, it's 20 years, it's whatever number you care to insert, with whatever rights of extension you care to insert. And then say, but parties can contract out of it on an open-ended basis, whenever they want, whatever they want. One might ask, why were you bothering to legislate in the first place? Because it's a free-for-all. And therefore, the current legislation simply prohibits this, uh, at least. Sorry, I say that with a, certi a, a certitude which may mislead you. There isn't actually any real authority about it, but the general understanding is it's simply prohibited under Section 13. And faculty was of the view that that should be the general ruling proposition still, and that if standstill agreements are to be allowed, they should be very tightly controlled to deal with the kind of case where um, it is necessary to try to obviate the need to go into court immediately uh, because of some particular difficulty about the whole thing's likely to sort out, uh, but we just can't get somebody to sign up at the end sort of thing, as opposed to being an excuse for putting the matter off and off and off until eventually somebody says, I'm not playing anymore and it's in fact been used as a weapon to delay them long enough until the evidence is gone, and then you refuse to agree the next time, and they're caught. I also suspect that this argument about people being required to sue in great numbers of cases for lots of things on a protected basis is, can be readily exaggerated. It does happen. That's certainly true. It's uh, particularly notorious in the construction industry. But it doesn't take up much resource, in fact, because what tends to happen is you raise your action against all the people, and they serve the thing, get protection, run around to all the defenders and say, it's all right, you don't need to waste time defending this. We're going to s we're going to agree to stop this. We'll call it if we have to, to assist it. Once we've got the time bar broken, we'll stop and everybody can sort it out. It's not actually that much of an imposition. And we fear that you may be producing something worse to cure a minor problem by allowing anything other than the tightest of rules on standstill agreements. Basically, we consider if Parliament has decided that these are the rules on which people's rights are to be extinguished on these circumstances that should not be entitled to be altered by parties so-called agreeing, where the agreements may be more or less in somebody's interests. This is a situation in which, in some respects, Parliament may have to protect people from themselves. Right. Well, Mr. Sheridan, uh, Mr. Howie, uh, vehemently disagreeing with you there. Do you want to I come mean, back I on that? I think to some extent, the, f the first point Mr. Howie made, I think we're maybe speaking at cross purposes, because it's not the society's position that people should be able to contract out of it in advance. The example that he gives is a good one, where, for example, a bank have a, a bunch, bunch of solicitors in their panels and they say you're responsible for 30 years. That's not what we're suggesting, and that's what's covered uh, in terms of this. But in terms of the, the, the suggestion that it would be some sort of free-for-all, I, I just don't, I don't accept that, because where we're talking about having an agreement or standstill agreement, it has to have both sides agree. And if, say, for example, the insurers thought it was an unreasonable position to continue the period, they wouldn't need to agree and proceedings would need to be raised. So where you have to have both parties agreeing to the period being extended, I, I, I don't see any reason in principle why parties should be prevented from agreeing a contractual position. In terms of the suggestion that it's not a big problem in practice, that's not the society's experience. There are several hundred claims a year. Uh, the construction, and one is a good one, banks and uh, lender claims, for example, another one where there are several hundred actions raised, served, and, and effectively wasted 
time, not only for the solicitors and parties involved, but for the judicial resources. We don't see any reason in principle why you, you can't agree amongst commercial parties or individuals why that, why that should be the case. Okay. Do you want the final word on this, Mr Howie? Um, well, as far as judicial resources are concerned, with respect, that's, um, uh, that's uh, in danger of being... Uh, misunderstood because, of course, the whole point of these, if they're operated properly as judicial resources, are never actually involved. All that happens is that the case goes into court to be called if it has to be in the court of session. In the shadow court, it doesn't even need that. It's simply been served. It may not ever actually see a judge because people promptly assist the things in order to make sure that neither time nor money is spent if it can be avoided. Um, I suspect there is simply fundamentally a difference of view about what the right thing to do between Milan and Mr Sheridan and myself about this and I suspect it's a matter where the legislators are going to have to do what they're there to do which is make up their mind which way they're going to jump. Okay. Any members got any mop-up questions? It's um, difficult cases. I know they're small in number particularly. You know, I'll revert back to the convenience one I'm talking about and also the Patterson case. Um, they are small in number, but I think they're quite fundamental to confidence in the conveyancing system in particular. So therefore, do we just say, well, there's, these are these are just odd cases, in the big scheme of things, they don't really matter. But ultimately, if they are, if they become more high-profile cases, that people start to say, well, you know, here's people who thought they had purchased a property that was everything was fine, they engaged a professionally qualified solicitor, and that did not materialise. That surely puts into some question the um, the conveyancing system. Sorry, I'll no, I, mean, I, I don't. I, I don't know anything about the the, the 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 valley case you're talking about, particularly, and, and I'm not sure of the full details, of Mr. Patterson, case. But I, I do I do accept your point in principle that there has to be an element of confidence in the conveyancing system as a whole. And obviously the, the, the Parliament has looked at the registration and the land registration deeds and the whole land registration process. And as I understand it, there's an incentive to try and have all land registered on the land registry within the next sort of seven or eight years. And it may be that that will do something to resolve it, but I do get the point. Um, but I'm not sure what the solution is, because if you have a cut-off point at 20 years, as a point of general principle, there will always be situations where somebody doesn't know about it until after that period of time. You know, people buy homes and they can own them for 30, 40, 50 years without ever looking at the title deeds. And I'm just not sure what the solution is to that. I think the difficulty, I, I suspected that there might be some question about how many of these hard cases there are. And when Campbell Riddle was in the inner house, Lord Malcolm observed that, you know, there are going to be more of these harsh cases than perhaps had been thought when Morrison was decided. And I bent my mind to thinking if I could devise a way whereby I could think of uh, a way in which you could get an idea on some kind of scientific evidential basis as opposed to just what is ultimately anecdotal material from the likes of me about how many of these there are. And I regret I don't think there is. One of the reasons is that uh, if cases are abandoned for Morrison or Campbell Riddle type reasons, it will happen in private, quietly. Nothing will appear above the waterline. What will be seen in court is a document that's indistinguishable from the document that would go in if a pursuer had won on a settlement, a defender had won on a settlement. The case had gone away for umpteen reasons. There's simply just nothing will actually give it away. And the best you're actually going to be able to do is that there's anecdote and that the Morrison and Campbell Riddle have done quite a lot of damage and will do kill quite a lot more cases yet. But I think the difficulty that you have, particularly with your conveyancing cases, is that you're talking about losses which happen at such long terms that if you use that as being the determinant of where you were going to fix your ultimate long negative prescription, what we've been talking about is the Vicenium, the 20 year period. You will end up with a period so long that if you're applying it to uh, across the board just the general cutoff for all obligations, it'll be picking up all the other obligations that haven't been picked up by the five years. The sets of five years can carry on now. Instead of for four times, they could carry on for ten times because, let's say, 50 years was the ultimate 
cut-off date, and you would find yourself in the kind of difficulty, with the kind of cases that you'll find if you look up in 18th century and 17th century law books, when we did have 40 years as the period of long negative prescription, and you get these cases that go on and on, fighting on and on and on. Um, and the whole reason that things were pulled back in the 1970s to 20 years was to make a major reduction from the 40 years because it was felt that this just meant that people were trying to pursue obligations at 35 years when everybody was dead, half the evidence was lost, and it was just a hopeless endeavour for a court trying to work out what to do. So I think the difficulty is that this is simply demonstrating the old adage about the hard cases and the bad law. Um, if there is a problem, particularly in relation to conveyancing, that would suggest that the place to attack it is not in relation to uh, the general law of prescription, which is what you're considering here, but some legislation in relation to conveyancing. But I would caution that the problem may just be impossible. It's a function of this. If you have any line drawn in the sand as being where it go beyond that and your rights are extinguished, there is always some poor soul is going to find himself in some case on the wrong side of that line through no fault of his own, and there is nothing that human power can do about that. So it's, I don't think the remedy is in prescription. But I mean. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Finlay. Um, no more questions? Yeah. What? No, yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's that, that's all our questions. So uh, for you, anyway, we've still got the second panel to go. Um, so can I thank you for your time? And I'll suspend the meeting briefly so we can swap over. Right, um, so can I welcome our second panel this morning. Um, we've got Douglas McGregor of uh, Brodie's LLP, uh, Craig Connell QC of Pinsent Masons, Fenella Mason, um, Head of Construction and Project, Projects of Bernice Paul LLP, and uh, Ian Drummond of Shepherd and Wedderburn. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying, Mr uh, Drummond, your, your firm hasn't uh, given us any written evidence so far? No, that's right. We participated in the early stage of the workshop stage, but we didn't provide a written response. Okay. okay. It was suggested uh, earlier you might be the, the wild card on the panel. Because <laughs> we, don't, we have no idea what you're going to say. <laughs> right, so we'll move on to uh, questions. Um, you've obviously, you've all been uh, asked because you're you know, you're, you're, you're involved in construction and engineering disputes. I think you could uh, maybe gives a, a, a different uh, different tack to the previous panel, uh, and we'll start off again with Neil Finlay. Yeah, um, uh, it's that the previous panel was asking about section three and the um, extension uh, of prescription to 
uh, all obligations to pay money. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that section and whether you approve of, it, of what's been proposed and um, if you could um, talk about the ex exemptions and whether you agree with the exemptions as well. Something that troubles us in the construction arena on a regular basis, but I agree with the approach of the Commission and I agree with the introduction of the five year prescriptive period in relation to statutory obligations to make payment and the way the Commission have approached it and distinguished between um, statutory obligations which are more akin to private law rights as opposed to public law rights. And I think the way that they're approaching it, carving out as exceptions, the public law rights, so taxes and so on. But when you come to obligations, statutory obligations to make payment, one of the few experiences I've had in this arena is with clients in relation to SEPA invoices, which look like contractual invoices, but they don't prescribe. And that didn't seem terribly fair because they came about through what looked like a contract and were operated in a way that was like a contract, and yet, even although they hadn't been followed up and the client organisation had been bought and sold, so papers were lost, they were still exposed to an imprescriptible claim. So I agree with the approach that's been taken. Um, I think after some we, we agree with the approach which the uh, Commission have adopted. Um, we have no real difficulty with the proposed exceptions which have um, been agreed. We haven't been privy, I don't think, to the submissions that were made to the Commission um, by various bodies about those uh, exceptions. Obviously, in an ideal world, you would probably have no exceptions to a general rule, but um, uh, um, the decision has been taken and, and we don't have any, any problem um, with it. Uh, I think um, I heard the previous session and there was some talk about preserving the status quo effectively, and I think that is potentially a good reason for including some of the exceptions um, uh, that have been included. I think the only point perhaps we should make is maybe that the number of exceptions should be relatively limited. This is meant to be a general rule about statutory payments. And if you started getting a situation in which every statute started to introduce a new exception uh, to the general rule, that might cause problems for people. So we would like to see them fairly limited, but we have no difficulty with the ones in the, um, in the bill. I won't be deploying, deploying my wild card uh, just yet. Um, I agree with, with what's been said already. Um, we don't have any particular issue with the approach. I agree with the approach that's taken. And I think the exceptions that are listed are really policy ex exceptions. I can understand the policy behind them, but it, it's, it's clearly a matter for, for the Parliament as to whether, whether those are correct. I, I have nothing useful to add on this at all, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm not particularly representing the construction industry focus here, I mean, my view, position is more general, but uh, I agree with what the other speakers have said. We'll take up any more time. In terms of construction then, um, what kind of example areas would you be involved in this kind of area in terms of between two parties and payments? Would it be like from main contractor to subcontractor, that type of arrangement or how, what, would you, what would your involvement be as a construction lawyer in disputes around payment? Normally they're private rights. So yes, the disputes between contractor and his employer or the contractor and his subcontractors or um, between the design team. That's where our disputes lie. Can I ask, is that, a, is that an increasing phenomenon, disputes in those areas? It, it, it seems to us that it's very busy. It does seem to me to be cyclical. So when the economy is buoyant, we see more. We tend to see more disputes. Um, we are very busy with construction disputes at the moment. I mean, this is wider than the topic we're on, yeah. but I'm very interested in it. Um, it does seem to me that some of that um, practice of there being is almost becoming a, a standard practice in some contracts where you know dispute is just part of how it, some main contractors see the process i've heard for example i've heard from some uh, recently who are saying you know we we, we do work for a company uh, x and we know we will be in dispute with them 
irrespective of how good we do the job, the quality, the standard, the time scale, they just operate on the basis of we are going into dispute. I think I, I, I'm not sure that I would say that that parties go into a contract intending to go into dispute, but they probably go into the contract not having put enough money into it. And if there's not enough money in it, they will end up in a dispute because they will be desperate for more money and they won't price risks that are inherent yeah, in the job. I, I would tend to agree with that. There's two particular issues that people talk about in the industry at the moment, and that is that um, margins are so tight, you know, you're talking 1% to 3% maximum. So as soon as there's a, a problem on the project, even if it's fairly minor, that's the margin eaten up, eaten up for the contractor. So the contractor has to find a way of trying to make that back. Um, I, I, and I think you know that that is a problem. The, the other problem is, as as Miss Mason said, um, the issue of the lack of attention to design and, and pl planning because everything is done in such a rush now that often the temptation is to is to skimp on those aspects. Uh, and uh, apart from anything else, construction is a complex business, so there are going to be problems, and it is difficult to sort those out when margins are tight. I think contractors talk about in the olden days when margins were better, they were able to um, experience difficulties and, and resolve those with their clients and perhaps swallow some of the margin for the sake of future relationships. But I think that's much more difficult at the moment. So. It, sorry, sorry, can you a bit? It, and was part of this um, culture behind the Karelian collapse in your opinion? Difficult to say, but my, yeah. my sense would be that there would a lot of it would have been over optimistic bidding. It's a very, very competitive market and there's not enough. When I had you there, I had to ask. No, no, it's, it's okay, Mr. Finley, you know, I, I like to give a, a bit of leeway. It was, it was interesting. Who's, who's after you then? Have you finished your questions? Yeah. Okay. Question, sorry. Um, um, that was relating to the start date for five-year prescription and uh, uh, to pay damages. Um, uh, in relation to the reversal in Morrison case, um, the um, Law Commission consulted on four options for Section 5 before deciding to use Section A, uh, Option 3. Um, what's your preference in terms of the options that were put forward? Are you happy with Option 3 being the, the one that is favoured? I was certainly in favour of option three. Um, I think it represents the best balance of curing the current situation and moving back towards what the law was before ICL plastics, but also this new ingredient of needing to know the identity of the person. And, and I know the concern has been expressed um, that that will unduly lengthen the time until which the five-year period starts running. But I think my opinion is it's actually quite a short hop between B and C, namely once you know, once the party who's got a potential claim knows that the loss, injury, injury or damage has been caused by a person's act or omission, it tends to be a pretty short gap between knowing the identity of that person. But I think it's fair, uh, it's a fair balance to reach um, to say to somebody, if you don't uh, pursue your rights within a certain period of time, you lose them. Um, I think the corollary to that is you must allow that person to know and to discover that loss has been occurred, that it's due to somebody's act or omission and that, you know, to know the identity of the person so that they can actually pursue those rights in court. So I, I think it's a fair balance. And the, the concern that was being discussed earlier about the five-year period perhaps moving um, on too much, because um, one of the balancing aspects to that that the Law Commission pointed out is the fact that the 20-year period is arguably um, becoming shorter. So I think they felt, and, and I agree with this, that that's a, a counteracting aspect that helps keep the balance. I agree with that. We were horrified by the stock line decision. It seemed unfair and, and unduly harsh, and the proposed reform um, puts a much fairer balance, I'd say, between both parties. I was just going to say, we, we, we also opted for option three when we responded to the consultation, and we are quite happy with the, with the bill. To go for no, I, I, I didn't go for that. Um, and, and I... I did wonder, I, mean, I think the members of the committee should probably understand that this, is, this area of law is every lawyer's nightmare. 
Um, you know, th these, these are very difficult areas. Whatever the Scottish Government says, the effect of the bill is going to be, uh, they're going to continue to be difficult. It gives everybody nightmares when we're looking at prescription. It's the least favourite question to be asked. Um, these are very difficult areas. Um, if perhaps I can illustrate uh, the position by perhaps disagreeing with something that Mr Howie said to you uh, earlier, if you take Stockline, um, you know, the place blew up. Um, generally speaking, the conclusion would be that doesn't tend to happen just you know, due to an act of God or, or something. There's likely to be some fault in there somewhere. And I suspect many people would have taken the view that uh, proceedings ought to have been raised, if at all possible, against somebody uh, within five years of the incident. Now, there might have been a debate about who it was. Perhaps more than one target might have been uh, identified. Uh, and what, one of the difficult questions that arises in these areas, and I'm sorry to raise a sort of broader issue, is, is what is the five years intended to be for? This was a question I, I raised with the, the, the Commission. Uh, if you have if you follow the theory of the average case through and you know that there's a loss and you know it's due to somebody's fault and you know who the somebody is, what's, what policy purpose does giving you then five years uh, actually... Uh, fulfill, because that's a quite a long time just to start the proceedings, uh, which might then take uh, some further time. I wouldn't necessarily agree with Mr Howie that proceedings nowadays are going to take ages, because other policy initiatives uh, that this committee may be peripherally aware of are all designed to make court proceedings uh, more efficient and speedier and so on. Um, so it, it, I, I think it's quite a difficult exercise uh, Mr Drummond talks about the balance, and that is one thing that the Commission referred to, trying to create a sort of balance between different competing interests. And my only comment on that is that, um, and everybody's anecdotal material is different, but in my experience over a depressingly large number of years in contentious work, 20-year prescription cases in any form are pretty rare animals. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been asked about 20-year prescription, but it's not that many. Five-year cases are always on the table somewhere in the mix. So any extension of a five-year period, uh, potentially by quite a long time, um, and this could be quite a long time by the time you have all the elements, uh, impacts far more cases in just in terms of volume of claims uh, than any 20-year change. So, so I, I think it's, this is quite a difficult balance. This is where the Commission has decided uh, to fix it uh, the, the issue of the identity is actually quite well illustrated by Stockline, because in that case, you might well have thought, well, building blows up, I'm injured, I've got a claim. And really, the only question was who. Um, now, there was an obvious target, uh, as further investigations revealed, perhaps a less obvious target emerged in relation to the, the gas systems and so on. Uh, but undoubtedly, it does have the scope for substantially extending the period. If you take the view that, broadly speaking, the way the world is going now is actually to tighten time limits, um, you'll find you know, if your average personal injury case ends after three years. If you don't get off your mark and sue, there are other statutory provisions which talk about one year. Most people who have contracts with bars on claims have shorter periods. So uh, I, I felt perhaps the balance had tilted a bit more, but that's just a personal view. Okay, thanks for that. Okay. You you got a follow up? No. Okay. Uh, David. Yeah. And good morning, everybody. Section eight of the bill proposes a new start date for a twenty-year prescription, which will be earlier in some cases than the current law, and never later. For the benefit of the record, what are your views on what is proposed here? My my view is that I agree with the approach that's been taken. I think. Um, it has the benefit of certainty, and that's the overriding aim of, of this, this change to the legislation. Um, I don't, whilst this will tend to shorten the 20 year prescription period, I, I suppose, particularly in the sphere of work that, that I'm in and, and Miss Mason's in, of building contract disputes. Um, so it, may, it, it probably will shorten that period. I don't see that that will create a, a problem in practice. I don't think we are going to see lots of cases which will fall foul of the new, slightly shorter period. Uh, certainly at the moment, um, the difficulty is usually with the five-year period. I, I very, 
I think maybe once in my career to date if I had an issue with a potential 20-year period. So it's, it's not a big issue, and therefore I think this approach um, is, uh, is important for the benefit, certainly, because I think um, for most people who, who practice, if you ask them what's the point of the 20-year period, they would say it, it, it's a long stop. And I, I think most people, e even you know, solicitors who practice in this area, perhaps wouldn't quite appreciate that the, the date when the period starts can actually be uh, quite a lot later than they might think. And then, of course, you have the aspect of it being interrupted. So I, I think from the point of view of being a true long stop and being certain, I, I favour the approach that's being taken. I, I agree that it's a very difficult area um, and that... One, n now one is moving towards when the wrong occurs as opposed to previously you had to have damage. So for, for in my area of work, we would have waited until cracking occurred in the building and the 20 years would have started from the cracking, whereas now the 20 years starts from the wrongful design, for example, that allows the cracking to emerge. So in big infrastructure projects, for example, the Queen's Free Crossing, if one of your designers back in 2008 creates a, a doomed or defective design, the, build, the structure wasn't opened until 2017, it's not unusual that it might take 10, 12 years for the problem to manifest itself, by which time it's, it's too late. The, it's more than 20 years since the wrongful design was created, and I suppose that's exactly the same as the your situation with Mr. Patterson and his defective conveyancing. The right to pursue it has gone, and it is harsh and it's difficult, but we've talked around it and around it and come back to the same position that you have to draw a line somewhere, and the problem is that after 20 years you can't find the records, you can't find the witnesses, people have died, they've left the company, and it becomes incredibly difficult to pursue an action anyway. So, overall, I think it is the right thing to do. The thing to do because it's difficult to do something else. It's simpler and it's cleaner and it's logical. Your bridge example was very good because these are long-term projects. So, you know, is it, is, is it right? I mean, Mr Howie seemed to think it is, it, it is right to set this limit, but... In a case like that, where problems may only emerge, you know, some years down down the line, you know, is 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 it right to set a, a twenty year limit? It, it's for us the, the different. There's a, a marked difference between the position of the designer and the position of the contractor. And with the contractor, it's much easier to see that the twen twenty years from the date of the wrong is fair because the wrong will be when he completes the structure and hands it over. So the 20 years would only start on the bridge, for example, for the contractor in 2017. Whereas the designer, in the big project, he's done so much in advance before anybody ever puts it into place. So there is a, there is a, a disparity there, but I can't see a way of dealing with that in the legislative reform. There is, there is a disparity. Mm. And you're not going to have any idea that the designer's done something wrong until the bridge is open and has been in operation for, for some years. Sorry, does anyone else want to come in? Well, I, I, I agree. With the principle of, of the 20 years, and I think it, uh, we have to acknowledge that this is simply a question of policy. Most jurisdictions have some kind of long stop and they just take a view. Uh, others have, other jurisdictions have a period less than 20 years. Uh, 20 years is, isn't particularly short or out of out of place. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I think you have an, a simple rule. And once everybody knows that, then they gear themselves up. Uh, they, they inspect the bridge or whatever it is uh, in order to try to, to find it out. Uh, and I think that the reality of trying to deal with claims after a very long period of time is quite significant. Uh, we had one I think I mentioned my response that, that came in where somebody was complaining about something done on a document 47 years previously, and everybody went, well, who, who was that? Oh, I, I can see the initials on the document. Oh, this person is dead. Anyone who worked with them is gone. 
uh, the papers are being destroyed. And even with the electronic world, it's very, very difficult to track random emails from a very long period ago. So um, I think there was a case actually involving the Kingston Bridge in Glasgow that I have a vague recollection of. I can't remember now why. Uh, and, and it caused enormous problems because under the previous law, it was said that no loss had been incurred until many years after the event, therefore time hadn't started to run, and people were trying to traipse back into history. Uh, and then you get great difficulties getting a just solution after, af after that time. So it, it's just a question of policy, and I think it's a right one. <coughs> we, we also agree with the right policy, really for the reasons which have been given, clarity, certainty. I think it's also more in keeping with the, um, the idea of the 20-year period as a long stop. And... And we have, I think, in the bill, a package of reforms to the 20-year period, all, which all taken together create that long stop uh, period. I think probably the only point maybe that's worth making is that in the, as far as the 20-year prescriptive period is concerned, awareness of loss has never been an issue. So it's not like the five-year prescription where uh, the period is delayed by lack of awareness. In the 20 years, it's awareness has never been an issue. What's looked at is the fact of loss, injury and damage having occurred um, and that in itself is a separate argument which people have from time to time in cases. Um, but it's not, it's not as if that awareness issue is being removed um, by the bill. The Law Society and the faculty have previously expressed some concerns about how Section 8 would work in relation to admission to the Act and continuing breaches. What are you, your views on this topic, including the SLC's commitments, comments sorry, on this during the first evidence session? I think rather like the last panel, um, for myself, I, I, I sort of struggled to see a solution to that because it's an omission is by potentially, you know, by definition, something that hasn't been noticed. You know, it's it's an act that, that hasn't been done that ought to have been done. And if it hasn't been done, then it's difficult to know, <laughs> you know, for, um, that, that that's absent. So I, I, I don't see any solution to it myself. Um, I think... Um, section 8 is, um, I, I agree with the approach that's taken. I think that's probably all I can say. Yeah, I, I, I listened to what was said uh, earlier, um, which I found quite interesting. Uh, and th the only reconciliation I, I could make is that if you're dealing with a claim which arises from the involvement of some form of professional, that might be a surveyor, it might be a lawyer, might work, there's usually a time when that person ceases to be involved in the matter. Um, and the omission would then presumably cease when their engagement finished. So in practice, it might not be as repeatedly difficult to deal with this as been suggested. But beyond that, I have nothing useful to add. I, I would agree with the comments um, that have been made. Omissions are harder to deal with than acts, um, but um, I don't think there is any way that the bill can really deal with or address that problem. You don't don't all feel we have to answer <laughs> every question. Can I just ask just for fun? Yeah. Do you all um, are you all defending cases that, like, from people who are claiming, or are you on both sides of the prosecute? Both. both. Sides. Yeah, both. That's fine. Just so. Mr. Torrance. I think they've answered the, the question on Mr. Parsons um, in the earlier evidence. <coughs> right. Okay, so go on to uh, Stuart. Thank you. Um, good morning, panel. Uh, we'll go back to Section 6 of the bill, and that's the, the issue regarding the 20-year prescription and the, this uh, idea of um, should it or should it not actually be able to be interrupted, um, also for it to be extended to allow ongoing litigation uh, or other proceedings to finish. Um, can, you tell the, can you tell the committee what your thoughts are on uh, on that particular option. I, I probably part of answer already. I mean, my own uh, view is that um, if you ask most practitioners, they would consider the 20 year to be a pure long stop. So it starts as a period, it finishes, and that's it. Um, I think most practitioners wouldn't readily appreciate that it can be judicially interrupted by proceedings. And uh, I, I agree with the Commission's approach that that rather goes against the whole policy of it being a true long stop. So, I, I, again, I agree with the approach that's being taken. Okay. Sorry, I, I think in the consultation, um, 
period, we um, suggested that one possible alternative, I think it was referred to earlier, uh, might be that the 20-year period would simply be suspended for the period of the court action so that you would have a, uh, uh, the period that had run before the action was raised, you would then have the period of the court action, then you would have the remainder of the 20-year period. Um, it, that is only one possible alternative, uh, and I think there are benefits um, to it in the sense that it's a halfway house between what we have at the moment uh, and what the Commission are uh, proposing. Um, but I think our real problem uh, and the reason we, we raised the issue in the first place was the concerns that we had about the possibility of rights prescribing during the course of litigation. And that is being dealt with by the Commission elsewhere in the bill. So that concern flies off. And in those circumstances, I, I think we're now in the position where we accept that the proposals which the Commission have put forward fit better within the framework of the 73 Act. And we're quite content with the um, decision that it should not be capable of any interruption or suspension. I, I would agree with that. I think the current situation of restarting the clock makes no sense. We've got a 20-year period, it runs. That should be it. Right. No, I've, I've nothing to add to that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, certainly on the back of um, what uh, Mr McGregor uh, said and what Ms Mason agreed to, Mr Drummond, also your position is uh, it's also just to kind of continue. Um, do you agree or disagree with your with your colleagues in the panel, or, or do you have any uh, would you have any anything further to add? Well, well, my position is the same actually, um, that the twenty year period should start and should stop over that twenty years continuously, which is what the commission is proposing. I mean, I, I didn't mention the subsidiary point, which is that there ought to be a short extension at the end, say, if there is proceedings on the go. And I think that's, that has to be uh, the, the position, because obviously you can't have a situation where um, rights are litigated prior to the end of the 20-year period, and then they end just because the 20-year period comes to an end. So that, that's good common sense, in, in my view. Okay. Okay. Um, section 7. <coughs> excuse me. Section 7 of the bill uh, says that uh, the type of 20-year prescription uh, applicable to certain property rights can no longer be interrupted. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, again, uh, there is the, the possibility of an extension until our ongoing litigation or other proceedings to finish. And the faculty has previously suggested that this approach might not work uh, as well for property rights like servitudes, as we heard in the, uh, from the faculty earlier. Uh, and certainly, uh, can, the, uh, can the panel provide uh, the committee with uh, any thoughts on, the, on that particular issue, please? Not my area, but I listened to what Mr. Howie said, and I was in complete agreement with him. It made complete sense. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, uh, uh, convener. That it made logical sense. I, I don't think the intention of the drafting was actually to cut off any right. That wasn't the way it was structured. Uh, but I don't have any concrete examples. I'm afraid to offer you. Okay. All right. No. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so you, you, you heard the discussion earlier about uh, the co contracting out. Um, so I wonder if I can just ask for, for your views on that. Um, I think I should start by saying that we're, we agree with the Commission entirely that opting out um, or contracting out should be um, available to parties. Um, it's only available to parties in relation to uh, the Section 6, 5-year, and the Section 8A, the 2-year uh, prescriptive uh, periods. We agree that it should be um, limited to one uh, chance at uh, varying the period, um, that it should be a maximum of one year, uh, uh, and um, that it has to be during the statutory uh, prescriptive period. Um, the only cons remaining concern really we have about Section 13 is in relation to the language in section 13, it talks very specifically about extending the prescriptive period um, and provides parties with the right to um, extend it. What it doesn't talk about is suspending the prescriptive uh, period. And in reality, our view is that that is probably, in many cases, a more attractive option um, for uh, parties. It would also work better with the one-year restriction because parties would have more certainty about the length of time they were agreeing to, su to suspend the prescriptive period. Um, 
where you are looking to extend a period by no more than one year, there needs to be some um, knowledge of the start date and the end date of the prescriptive period. And I think simply allowing or only allowing extension will cause problems uh, in the in the future. Um, so I think I think we would be keen to see the bill amended to allow suspension and possibly alongside extension because both can operate successfully. But we would certainly like to make sure that suspension is a is a, a possibility. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just um, endorse what Mr. McGregor said about suspension. I had the opportunity of discussing this with him before we joined the committee. It wasn't a point I'd considered, but as soon as he told me, I think it's an excellent point, because in reality, uh, these things arise. People haven't worked out a precise start date, a precise end date, and they're talking about extension. What you're actually talking about is pressing the pause button. Uh, and often, uh, it, it, my experience, what, what will happen, say, is that you, you think your claim is against A, um, and everybody thinks A is probably the right target, but actually it's possibly B, but then you're starting to worry about time bars, so what you're doing is, is pausing on B and until A gets, gets sorted out. Now, for that reason, I would agree with the Law Society's comment this morning about timing, because I don't see why it should be restricted in all cases to one year. There might be cases where a longer period uh, would be agreed. Uh, and I certainly don't agree with the faculty's view that this is some kind of abusive process. Um, now, everybody's experience is different, but uh, these things tend to arise in discussions between lawyers on both sides. Now, if somebody was bothered that some lay party was going to be bulldozed into something that was unwise, then no doubt, as in other legislation, you could write in that it's only possible if the party had independent legal advice or something of that kind. But I suspect that's an unnecessary precaution. Uh, these are usually discussed between lawyers in a messy situation where there's good reason to press the pause button. So I, I think it's an excellent idea. It's commonly used in England and Wales. That's no reason to do anything uh, just because it's used down there. But it, it is a practical solution. And although Mr Howie is right in saying that judicial resource isn't usually deployed to deal with these claims when they're commenced, um, it's not always easy in the Scottish system where you have to serve the proceedings. In England, you just have to issue them and you get them past the court. In Scotland, you have to serve proceedings to break the time bar. And that can mean finding somebody who you may not be very sure where they are or they've moved a dress or the company has changed or whatever. And if you're forced to rush about and do that, it can be productive of uh, certainly worry and, and expense as well. So the, the option uh, is, I think, very worthwhile. How Big a difference cost-wise, I think, could be readily exaggerated, but nevertheless an option that's worthwhile. Ms. We're very much in favour of the introduction of a standstill agreement, and we have had experience of um, English clients or English lawyers saying to us, well, could, can we not just have a standstill agreement, please? We're all talking about the problem. We don't know the cause of the defect that's emerged. We want to investigate it. We don't want to litigate. And our advice ha has to be, I'm sorry, we can't do that for you. We have to litigate in order to stop the clock from running. So it sets the scene and perhaps puts parties against each other when they had been working together. So a standstill agreement, um, I think, would be a welcome introduction. There, there's another point in relation to contracting out that causes us a real concern and for some reason hasn't been picked up by the Scottish Law Commission in, in this report. It's been sort of dismissed but was picked up in the 1989 report, and that is in relation to the party's ability to shorten the prescriptive period. And that is an issue that we come across on a regular basis. And I understand that the reluctance of the um, Law Commission to get into this is because of the distinction between prescription and limitation. And you're probably all looking blank, and a lot of lawyers look blank. And to my mind, it's a pretty artificial distinction the commercial reality is that parties need to be able to price for a risk, and in the big infrastructure jobs that we see, they will accept around a 12-year period for risk. And everybody knows that's the position. And what we don't want to see is parties arguing about whether um, that clause in the contract, which says we're only on the hook for 12 years, is prescription and therefore void and null because it's an attempt to contract out or whether it's limitation which is allowed and if the language is incorrect then it may be that it falls foul 
of the legislation, and there seems to be no point in having legislation that's um, here to, you know, we know the purpose of this legislation, it's to produce certainty and avoid stale claims. It's not there to interfere with the freedom to contract. And there is a real missed opportunity, I would say, in this legislation. And in the 1989 report, the draft bill provides, to my mind, very adequate wording as to how to deal with this problem. And it makes it clear that you can, by contract, limit your exposure and that that is not in, in the face of the legislation. And I think it's a great shame that we haven't taken the opportunity here to uh, reassert that. Okay, that's very that's very useful. Sorry, Mr. Drummond. You would, would you mind if I, if I just yeah. commented on two points? I, I tend to agree with most of what has been said already. I think just picking up on two points, um, the limitation on the standstill agreement uh, allowance to one year, um, I think in practice that would make um, the utility of those standstill agreements, it, it would undermine their utility because I, I can think of three cases at the moment that my small team is handling where the period to investigate issues with building and, and engineering defects is taking much longer than a year because they are so complex. So I, I think the ten tendency would be just simply not to use them if they were restricted to one year uh, in practice and, and for proceedings just to be raised in a protective way as is done at the moment. So I thought that would be my concern. If we're going to have standstill agreements, let's make sure they have a commercial utility. Um, but secondly, um, I absolutely agree with a point um, that's just been said um, about the fact that there's no reference um, to an ability um, to uh, shorten a limit or, or rather restrict the limitation period. Because in the Scottish Law Commission's report, they do specifically pick up on contractual limitation clauses, both in the area of conveyancing, but also in building contract claims. And what they say is they do not want the provisions of 13 to disturb commercial parties' ability to enter into contractual limitation clauses. But my concern is the same, is that what's now provided in this clause 13 doesn't make that clear. And I think will give rise to arguments in the courts in future as to whether or not um, this new clause 4B in particular strikes down contract limitation clauses as, as well, which the um, Law Commission has specifically said it's not intended to do. So I, 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 I think my preference would be if there were some sort of clarification in this clause to spe specifically say that contractual limitation clauses are not intended to be struck down by this. I mean, I, I, I think perhaps the general rule is it's not particularly good um, statutory drafting to uh, put in a sort of for the avoidance of doubt provision. But I mean, that, that's already done elsewhere in this, this proposed bill, for example, at um, five, three, uh, sorry, section five, provision 5.3b, um, where it's said that um, where one's looking at the facts that uh, a litigant needs to know um, in order for the five-year period to start running, 3b says, you know, almost for the avoidance of doubt, you don't need to, you don't need to be aware that the act or omission is actionable. And I think what my preference would be to see a similar provision in 4b that preserves contractual limitation clauses. Does everyone else agree with that? don't necessarily agree. I, I, I quite see the problem that um, is being talked about. I, I think the, the view that, that, that we formed was that the bill as presently drafted would not prevent contractual limitation um, clauses, but, but clearly others have formed a different view, and, and that will become an argument, no doubt, at some, at some date. So there, there may be some advantage in clarifying that particular issue just to prevent any dispute arising in, in future. Yeah. I, I think that is the problem. It, it leaves open scope for argument which is unnecessary and unhelpful. And, and the, these clauses are used widespread across PFI contracts, building contracts. It, it's, it's something that's come from English law, but it, it's established. Um, so, you know, if there's not clarity in protecting that, I think that will give rise to a lot of arguments. Yeah, I, 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 speaking personally, I've not come across the argument about the, the, the clause and whether it falls foul, but maybe just the, the nature of uh, the random nature of anyone's general practice. Uh, obviously, the committee will be aware that, that it's commonplace in contract of every kind, which everyone will enter into, for a provision to be sitting there basically saying, if you want to complain about this, you must do it. You must make a claim or whatever within a particular period of time. Uh, and in the main, it doesn't seem to have caused a, a problem, but I have nothing more to add. 
Um, well, thanks, Mr. Mason, for raising that. And if any of you want to write to us uh, with your further thoughts on that, um, please feel free to do so. Um, any further questions from members? No? Okay, well, um, I will close the session and thank you very much for your time. Um, a couple of very interesting sessions there, uh, and I'll suspend the meeting. <laughs>